morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to present a study today where uh, I compare different gas models um, to try and model the spring characteristics of a hydropneumatic spring. Um, typically, applications of this is trying to try out prototypes or different configurations on a vehicle and to see what the results is, are um, while simulating them before you go into actual prototypes. Um, so it's saving you time and money in the development process. So the suspension that I used in, in the study is the Force 4 hydropneumatic suspension. This was developed by Professor Els, our previous speaker, um, quite a few years ago. And this suspension has four states. It can switch between um, high damping and low damping. And this simply takes place by opening and closing uh, valve 1 and valve 2, which you can see here on the diagram. And this just bypasses the, the damper valve, or if it's closed, it forces the oil flow through the damper valve. Um, similarly, it has two spring characteristics as well. So you can switch between a stiff spring and a soft spring. And again, this takes place by opening and closing valve free. Um, so either using the small 0.1 liter accumulator as your spring, and if you open valve 3, you use both the 0.1 liter and the 0.4 liter um, gas accumulator as your gas spring in the suspension. And that will give you um, either a stiff spring or a softer spring. Um, there's also a mathematical, I used a mathematical model of the suspension. And this model consists of four forces, uh, four force models. Um, the damper force, which is, a, is in essence a lookup table from experimental data. Um, so you, you get a velocity input and it gives you a damper force output. Uh, similarly, the friction also experimentally determined and a lookup table is used to, to model the friction in the suspension. Then there's the bump stop force. Um, now this didn't really play a role. Actually, it, it very rarely plays a role under normal testing circumstances. Um, but this is modeled using a polynomial. And then um, for this study, I look primarily at the gas models modeling the spring force in the suspension. Um, it's also important to take note because it's a hydropneumatic suspension where you have oil compressing the gas accumulator, um, you also need to take into account gas of oil compression. And this is done by um, a bulk, using bulk modulus equation with an experimentally determined bulk modulus. Um, so in this study, I looked at five different gas models. Uh, the first being a very simple uh, model, the ideal gas isothermal model, where we um, assume that the temperature in the gas will stay constant. And um, then secondly, I looked at the ideal gas adiabatic model, where it's again an idle gas approach, but you assume that the gas will, um, the temperature in the gas will rise somewhat if you compress, and so on. That's why you get um, that uh, PV to the power n, with n in this case for adiabatic model equal to 1.4. Then I looked at the real gas approach, which, which in this case is the Benedict Webb Rubin equation, um, and also uh, isothermal, so I kept the temperature constant, and um, so this is just, it's similar to the idle gas model, it's just a real gas approach. And then the fourth model was, is the idle gas model with an energy equation, so in this case we take into account the heat exchange with the surrounding, um, through the uh, accumulator wall with the surrounding, and this will then, in essence, adjust according to the input because you can take into account the heat exchange uh, fr with, from your gas to with the surroundings. Similarly, I also then looked at the Benedict Webb Rubin equation again with the energy equation as you can see here below. Um, just maybe for interest sake, um, one can see that the idle gas and the Benedict Webb Rubin equation in essence is the same thing 
except that for the real gas approach, I have a lot of corrective terms to try and model um, some of the points where, like for instance, at, at low temperatures or higher pressures, where your idle gas starts to deviate. Um, the real gas approach has some corrective terms to try and model that better. Um, this is just a simple simulation where I gave a ramp input to all of these models and then I looked at the pressure. And one can see that the three models, the purple line there and the red and black, is the three models without the energy equation and one can see that it increases in pressure and once you stop it just stays at that pressure. Whereas the two models with the energy equation will increase and once you stop it will take into account that some of the heat is actually dissipated through um, the accumulator wall and you will see a pressure drop over time. And this will, will then be, um, this was also experimentally determined um, by Professor Els a few years ago to get that thermal time constant um, where you will regress to 63% of the pressure. So then I took these models and I compared them to lab, lab experiments where we took the suspension and it was um, given a certain input and I took that same input and gave that to each of these models. And we can see here at the top graph where it's a relatively low um, frequency input, 0 0.001 hertz. Um, so in this case, your isothermal approach or isothermal assumption will be a relatively good assumption because it's a very slow input and there's enough time for the heat to dissipate. And one can see here that the isothermal, the red line there, the isothermal um, idle gas model gives relatively good correlation as well as the idle gas model with the energy equation. Um, but the adiabatic model um, over predicts the force quite significantly um, because it assumes that there will be some energy or some temperature rise in the gas which is not a good assumption in this case. If we then look at the bottom graph, this is a high frequency input, so in this case the adiabatic model performs well because there is an, um, temperature, a temperature rise in the gas, whereas the isothermal model underpredicts the force quite significantly. And one can see here how the model with the energy equation adjusts to um, both of these cases because it takes into account the exchange, heat exchange with the surroundings. Similarly here um, with the real gas approaches, um, the energy equation predicts both the high frequency and the low frequency with good accuracy, whereas the isothermal um, under predicts the force when we get to higher frequencies. Um, so for both um, the soft suspension and the harder suspension, I found that um, the real gas approach of the energy equation gave quite significantly better results. Um, one can see here a relative mean relative error of 3.26%, um, whereas, for instance, your adiabatic model on the soft suspension can will give a relative error of about 15.5%. Um, I then decided to take this a step further and implement it in a full vehicle model and then compare this with full vehicle um, results. Um, in order to try and reduce the amount of errors from your vehicle model, because we're actually just looking at the suspension model, it was decided to do this on the step suspension where we have lower roll angles, um, which means we have less, lesser amount of errors um, from the vehicle model itself. And we also see higher pressures, because this is where the models start to deviate um, from the actual results. So it's a better um, area to try and, and get the accuracy of, of your gas model. And I then took the, the best and the worst model um, and compared them to each other. So in, in case of the step suspension, this was the idle gas as a thermal model and the Benedict Webb Rubin model with the energy equation. Um, with both, both the best and the worst model. 
I then implemented both of them in, in the full vehicle model and simulated a double lane change, which we also did an experimental run, run with at about 75 kilometers an hour. And we found that uh, Benedict Webb Rubin with the energy equation actually performed better, but only marginally. Um, one can see here that it's about a, a 3% improvement in terms of the mean relative error, which when looking at the, the experimental or the lab, laboratory results, this seems a bit, bit small. Um, so we kind of went and think again uh, about uh, the, the approach here and whether displacement is really a an, an good mm -hmm. way to measure the accuracy of a, of a gas model. And thinking about this, this was actually not the best way to, to measure the accuracy because you can rather use pressure, which reduces the amount of simulated forces in your suspension. So you rather have less other force models in your model to, to try and um, get the accuracy of your gas model. Another thing which we also found is that there's some um, uncertainty as to when we we're charging the gas in the suspension as to the actual amount of gas in each suspension unit. So I took the experimental data and optimized um, the model or in terms of the gas volume, the, the ambient temperature and um, the initial pressure to try and determine this, the amount of gas in each suspension. And this actually worked very well. Um, this is some uh, a typical um, example of the optimized suspension and then giving the, the suspension model the same input that the actual uh, suspension experienced on the vehicle. This is a pressure correlation between um, the two, the model and the experimental data and that's, that's really very close. Here we can also see um, the pressure with um, before the damper packs and that includes the damper force and it's really relatively good um, correlation that we've obtained. Looking at the results, we found that there was actually quite a discrepancy between the 0 0.1 liter volume that we assumed and the actual volumes. Um, for instance, left front there is 0 0.073, so it's uh, quite a bit less than what we expected the, the gas amount to be. So I then used these um, gas amounts to again model the uh, suspension or the full vehicle simulations and we then, I then found that the BWR model with the energy equation now gives about a 22.5% improvement in the mean relative error. So the improvement is quite a bit bigger. It's, it's what, what you would have expected after looking at the laboratory results. And from this I can conclude that you can get quite a significant improvement by implementing the energy equation in your model. Um, it's also worth noting that this is at a relatively low frequency input. Um, a double line change will give you a, a quite low frequency input on your suspension. So this is, this is the area where your ideal gas isothermal model should perform at its best. So if you're going to do drive, for instance, over a rough terrain and you have a higher frequency input, um, this improvement should become larger. So um, this, is, this is really probably the smallest improvement you'll see. You, you should see something higher when you, you have higher frequency inputs. Um, just for interest sake, again, I just show the displacement um, correlation. And one can see there the BWR model with the energy equation, the blue line, and the green line being the experimental. And the correlation between that, taking into account the complexity of the model, that this is a full vehicle model, um, that you can get suspension displacement up to that amount of accuracy. In this case, it's really, um, I think, quite good. Um, so from this, it was concluded that, that it really gives you quite an improvement in, in correlation to use the energy equation um, with, with your gas model. Um, this can also be done with the ideal gas model. It's not, not really recommended because the real gas approach just gives you a slight bit more, more accuracy um, 
when modeling a gas in, in a suspension. Thank you. Any questions?